So um, uh, this this um, sort of workshop workshop session builds on the first session that we held, involving um, it's all under the rubric of growing and sustaining a design career, because I think the whole uh, uh, emphasis for this subject is that uh, careers tend to last longer, you know, at least in theory, in some cases, 40 years and plus. And, and the nature of a career sort of evolves and sort of morphs, segues into other sort of mini cul-de-sacs sometimes, but that it's kind of the nature of design practice can also evolve over time. And you can find yourself either sort of like, you know, um, enjoying that process or not so much joy enjoying that process. In fact, there've been a lot of designers over the last 20 years who've sort of been left in the dust um, simply because, you know, things have changed rapidly and expectations have changed. And, and so, we wanted to talk about this subject today. My uh, sort of co-presenter and author on this is uh, Angela Anderson and Angela will be uh, participating uh, uh, in various pieces and parts and various sections of this little presentation. We're gonna talk for probably about, well, we have like five different sort of sections, if you will, or chapters maybe, if you will on this uh, presentation. And I hope that you will access the chat board uh, maybe to post some questions that we can maybe respond to and such, or you can just pipe up and voice if you like as well. Um, and then sort of, so there'll be some just conversation or kind of quote unquote lecture a little bit where I'll sort of lead the discussion and then We'll take a sort of short uh, Q and A break that will last. There will be two Q and A breaks for ten minutes each, sort of interspersed throughout the thing. And so at that time, we'll have we'll sort of pose a question and ask you guys to contribute, maybe some, offer some inputs or answers to some of the, to to those two questions because I think it would be really helpful and sort of gathering some of your best thoughts and ideas and then essentially trying to react to them possibly. So um, let me see, let's get going. Um, and uh, so uh, just sort of a little introductory information. Also this, this, um, this document, this deck, uh, PDF deck, uh, I uh, think I posted a link to this or I shared that link with uh, Tom and Lars and maybe somebody could post that in the uh, chat window and you could download the PDF and refer to it, and, you know, and keep it, uh, it because there's actually quite a bit of content in here and it's worthwhile maybe going back and figuring out what in the heck we were talking about. So, um, yeah, Michael, I think you, you might need to give me permission on that. I don't know if you, okay. want to, if you want me to post it in the chat, I think I okay. sent you a link, but maybe you don't want to stop and do that right now, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, let's let's maybe do it, uh, maybe when Angela's uh, giving part of her um, uh, material, okay? Okay. Great, thank you. So, okay, so let's get going. Um, basically, uh, this workshop I put together just kind of on a lark because I figured that you can't really encapsulate a whole career sort of in a hour and a half session and do it any justice because a career really changes a lot. And there's lots of different facets to it that may not show up until maybe uh, the second or third phase of a career. And as a result, there, there, this, this particular session tonight is focusing more on the second phase of a design career. The July session focused more on the first phase, maybe the first uh, 10 to 12, possibly even 14 years of a career. And um, so for mid-career designers, 
that's kind of the target or at least the subject that I think would be um, most pointed for, for folks here. If you already happen to be in the mid stage of your career or not quite, it's still something to consider. And um, so uh, we wanted to talk about some of the assets, skills that, that can be brought to bear. We also wanted to talk about some of the darker aspects of a career and frustrating fears and frustration, you know, just bad situations that tend to happen. Also kind of the emotional ups and downs of a career are worth talking about. And so the challenge here is to try to figure out how to sustain a productive professional career over time and, uh, you know, and make it worthwhile and a positive experience and really develop your career and invest in it uh, so that it can feed you just, <laughs> you know, uh, so that it can actually sustain you and your families, but also give you creative opportunities um, to con contribute. So we wanted to talk about some of the uncertainties uh, and various strategies as well. And um, essentially this, this career, we're gonna talk about it as if it were a design problem and trying to determine exactly how's the best way to manage a career and how can we as designers actually use some of the, the skills and talents that, um, and understandings that we have about solving sort of wicked problems and try to apply it and make it real in our own experience. So this session breaks down into these, you know, it's not quite how it sorts out right now, but I think there's like four or five different uh, sections to this. And we'll try to follow roughly closely along the lines of the schedule. But uh, first of all, I wanna just thank, uh, you know, Tom and, and uh, and Lars and the folks from UXPA for hosting this. And then also there's been some work done on my end at the University of Kansas um, with doing some um, sort of promotion. This is helpful for us. It's also helpful for us to try to um, do some, you know, marketing a bit for people who might wanna do advanced study in design and uh, sort of develop their career in that regard because it is a professional program. It's not just an academic uh, liberal arts type thing. Uh, <clears throat> so um, this is kind of the, what I call the conceit of, of this little um, workshop is that I kind of borrowed a concept from Aristotle and what he, what he sort of developed into something called three act storytelling. And <clears throat> it sort of, um, let's see here. Okay, it uh, has to do with uh, uh, essentially, you know, what he considered storytelling to be about a uh, chain, chain of causes and effects and actions and each action sort of leading to subsequent actions and so forth. Um, and this kind of three act storytelling, sometimes it's four or five acts well, that's evolved over time, it's, but it's, it's frequently carefully noted in theater, films and so forth. And the only thing that I've done here, and maybe not even the first time or the first person to do it, but how can we apply some of the thinking in three act storytelling to a career? And what carries forth, you know, some things hold in a career, some things don't. This is not theater exactly, but it can be theatrical. Um, and also I think it's, it's just a metaphor, so don't take it too seriously. If it, but what tends to happen over time is you tend to age, you tend to learn stuff, you tend to lose stuff. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a bit of a, a mystery ride because you don't always know exactly where you're gonna wind up. Um, so, also, I tended to, I guess, in the first uh, session in July, I used the, the, the metaphor of um, sort of a tree, if you will. Um, this, this act two of a career, if it's well ha handled, if it's well managed, can amount to a real evolution from act one. In other words, the things that you 
focus on so much in act one become less important. And there's other things that you can focus on in the second stage or act two of your career. Uh, the first act is all about building up your own professional knowledge, skills, experience, and so forth. But act two is, is different. It's oftentimes about contributing value to the broader organization and not even just a design team. And then act three goes even broader and I'll kind of like tease a little bit of that uh, at the end here. But essentially there's kind of an internal aspect to, the, to this, uh, to this uh, metaphor, if you will, things that you focus on um, that are sort of visible expressions, let's say things that you put out into the world. And then there's things that you draw um, in your career and you learn from and you develop and such. So it's kind of like an input and output. Uh, and you, know, you, you, you gain sustenance from the roots and you put out um, you know, gases into the air or you know, expressions into the air. So I'm gonna turn it over to Angela here. She's gonna tell us, um, you know, like we all have a story of sorts and she has a story of her own that I, that I thought would be really helpful and kind of relevant and uh, take it away, Angela. Okay, hi guys. Uh, Angela Anderson, I work for the Federal Reserve Bank Kansas City, creative director and interaction designer there. So I've been there for 22 years. Just wanna kind of give you a little bit of background before I dive into this. I was there for 22 years, uh, lead a talented group of designers that run the gamut between photographers, interaction designers, um, print designers, videography, animation. Um, people wonder what we do at the Fed and actually we do everything. So uh, we design logos and campaigns, but we also design websites, create experiences and design um, exhibits for our money museum, which is kind of cool. So. Our audiences range between educators and children, which is really fun for economic education. And it ranges to um, economic research, which is really pretty boring. So um, we're kind of all over the place. And so uh, I've been there for quite a while. And before that I, I worked for an NBC 41 affiliated television station. And that was a crazy stressful job. Um, and before that, I worked in-house at a couple other places. So I've kind of been all over the place and did different things, landed at the Fed. And um, I think Michael brought me on to tell you what not to do, <laughs> like learn from my mistakes, I think. So, um, so I'm going to tell you my story. And this, this story is humbling and not something that I like to share with people. So I'm going to share it with a bunch of new friends I just met at UXPA. So uh, bear with me here. So, okay. So uh, the first slide is survival of a designosaurus. So uh, designosaurus is, is kind of a joke term that my colleagues and I use um, and tease each other because we've all been around, you know, for a long time and we've been around at the Fed. We don't have a lot of turnover and, um, which means we have a lot of experience, but also, you know, we've been in the business a, a long time. So this term is good. And this term is also sort of bad. And I say that because, you know, we have a ton of experience, but we're trying to still stay relevant, you know, as we're working. And so you're, we're sort of institutionalized also in this in-house group. And so, um, you know, we know, and I've seen it firsthand as a creative director, my experience um, on my own, and then also other people that I went to college with who no longer design. So it's like, you can become extinct. You know, it's like you're working your career and all of a sudden everything changes before, before you realize it. And then you really sort of design yourself out of a job. So um, what I wanna talk about is that, you know, the experience and being relevant. So the idea that, you know, I have a ton of experience. I work for a television station, but you know everything changes so quickly now uh, with the expectations and this whole idea of being specialized or being you know more of a diverse as far as your skill set goes. And I've sort of seen it both ways. And I, I honestly think that it sort of cycles through this, you know, how technology advances and then also how the economic conditions are. Uh, for that sort of period of time. Um, if you're really diverse, 
and the job market is really, really tight, sometimes that helps you. Um, if the job market is good and and the economic conditions are good, then I think that you you can be more specialized. But I will say the more specialized you are, sometimes the more easy it is to get rid of you. Um, because if, if they can't hire a bunch of people, then they just want that one person who can sort of do everything. So it's, you know, I, I think um, the best thing is to sort of be both, you know, be that do that thing that you love. For me, it's design. I love to design. Um, that that's the thing I'm really good at. And then find these other things that I can add to my toolbox um, throughout my career that actually makes me more valuable that I can rely on. So now I feel like I can sort of go anywhere and I have all these different things that I can bring with me that maybe, you know, five years ago I couldn't. So I'll, I'll get into that. Michael, if you want to go to the next slide. Okay, so um, invisibility is not a superpower. So uh, this is my story. So, um, you know, I, I, in my early design career, working at the television station and then working at the Fed, I actually got to work on a lot of really cool projects at a really young age. So in reports, large campaigns, um, I built this great portfolio you know, I, I felt like I had a ton of tremendous growth as a designer and that helped me get to the next level, which I thought was art director and supervisor of the group. I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I set my sights on. That's the next, the next thing. So I thought managing the group was the way to continue to prove my value to my organization. So I became a supervisor. It worked really great. I enjoyed the leadership and things were, were more co cohesive because, you know, being an in-house group in the past, we had supervisors who didn't have any design experience, marketing experience. They were just somebody who rotated in. So I felt like having somebody over the group that had experience really helped us be more cohesive. So I, I did this, I did this for 10 years. The so time moved along. Um, I found myself doing more administrative work um, managing time attendance, managing clients, paying bills, dealing with RFPs and this work that was not fun. It was taking all my time and, um, it was work that honestly anybody could do besides the creative direction. And I love doing the creative direction, but I gave away all my great ideas. Um, and then I was just doing all the paperwork. So, um, during that time I did become very comfortable and kind of complacent. It's like I knew something was off, but I couldn't quite, um, you know, figure out what to do about it. Uh, so I designed less and less. My value was lost and I became invisible. And I started feeling like nobody asked me to these meetings. Uh, I felt like nobody really cared about my opinion anymore. Here I'm supposed to be the art director for the bank. We didn't have a creative director at the time. And so something was was wrong, you know, and so um, I, I uh, it took me a while to figure it out. But, um, you know, I felt like my career was withering on the vine, you know, like a lot of my friends who've already left the business. And, um, you know, quite honestly, there's some that stay in the game that probably shouldn't and they've lost their edge. So I, I feel like I was becoming one of those people and my career at atrophied. And I realized that I gave them value amnesia. They did not realize what I still brought to the table because I did not show them that anymore. You know, I was doing stuff that other people could do. And, you know, I think a lot of organizations are, their value memory is short. They're, they're like, you know what, Angela, you designed this website last year and that's great, but what have you done for me lately? And that continued pressure is really what should push us forward but I think sometimes it's easy, especially as you have kids and families and you have other things going on, it's easy to sort of lose sight of that pressure that should be sort of in our face. And if you're not in their face, your work, then your work doesn't have any value and then you're invisible. So um, I wish I would have figured this out before this happened, but um, you know, I, I have to value, demonstrate my value every day. Um, you know, my best work I know is good, but they expect that. So what's the next 
big thing, you know, there's always that next thing and then realizing those bad trade-offs. So not stopping what I'm best at to do things that anybody else can do, because that's not really valuable for anybody. But back then I was sort of too young and concerned with what management might say to go, Hey, you know, I don't want to pay bills anymore. I don't want to do this. I felt like that was part of the job. And so I didn't push back and I should have, um, and then just listening to that nagging voice in my head. Um, you know, if you feel invisible, you are invisible. Okay. Uh, next slide, Michael. Okay. So, um, you know, I started about 2013, I'm like, okay, this is not good. What do I do? Um, at that time when I was feeling pretty low, my confidence was shot. Um, our division restructured. And so they took, you know, after some conversations, administrative work off my plate. I didn't have any direct reports. Um, I retained creative direction and I started designing large projects again. So I felt kind of lost. Like, what do I do? Um, I was sad. I was happy. You know, it's like, do I leave, try to find something else? Do I stay and retool? I knew that something had to change. So I decided to go back to school and get a master's from KU in user experience and interaction design. So Fed would pay for it, which is awesome. Such a great value. It took me three and a half years, I will say, and I was totally terrified. I had to take a GRE and I bombed the math portion. They let me in anyway. So uh, it worked out, but um, you know, it, I was determined for something to change. So, so I worked really hard at school raising. I have uh, two kids and two step kids. So they were pretty young at the time and I was raising four kids and had a full-time job, but um, I was determined to change this perception that others had of me and to rebuild my value at work. So, but I felt like I was completely starting over. Um, so poured myself into the master's program and, you know, it started, I started thinking differently about how I approach projects and solving business problems in a completely different way. And so what I did is I took some of the projects I was getting and started using those in my case studies for school. So, you know, I started kind of building back my confidence and these new techniques uh, allowed me to demonstrate my new value at work. So they're like, hey, this is cool. She's bringing all this stuff we haven't seen before. So it built trust in me and they started changing their assumptions about me. Um, and so then I started using some design methods to solve problems and, um, it started allowing me to challenge assumptions about how we approach our work at the Fed. So I, I sort of went from completely bottom, rock rock bottom and, and kind of fast tracked up in three years um, to the top of feeling like I, I know what I'm doing, this is so great. So, you know, I would say that if you ever feel this way, you may not feel like this right now, but there may come in time that there are some things that you can do um, to sort of turn the ship around. So reinvention, enrichment, curiosity, try to restore your confidence. I think confidence is probably one of the most important things. Um, if you lose your confidence in your work, then you sort of lost everything. And so how do you get that back? What can you do for yourself, even if it's not for the organization to get that back? And then trying to build trust, You know, changing assumptions, using innovative ideas in your work, um, and change assumptions, change assumptions also. So, and then enjoying the process along the way. I think once I got into it, um, at KU, I started realizing like, this is kind of fun. This is kind of cool. Okay. Uh, Michael, next slide. Okay. So the shift forward. So, um, so I graduated in 2017 with my degree and I had several cool projects under my belt that I did as part of the KU program. And then they actually, they actually let me implement it at work, which is really neat. Um, you know, I, I realized after this and even putting this slide up together, um, before this experience, I was tackling problems with only half a toolkit, design, design. That's all I knew is design. And, you know, after going through this process and learning all these new things, I realized I wasn't really, I was just approaching 
things with sort of one side in mind. And, you know, I felt whole, like more strategic, more serious, more valuable. Um, in that process, I took this class, we learned 200 design methods in the semester. And it is the class I've referred back to probably the most in my day to day work. Um, I even share these design methods with other designers that I work with and even with analysts. I mean, I've started seeing them use it. So it's pretty cool. Um, and then I realized I'm not just a designer. I'm an interaction designer, service designer, design methods practitioner and a design thinking coach. So I went from being sort of one dimensional to, to a multifaceted designer. So I feel more confident and I'm a valuable member in my organization. And the journey has been humbling. I mean, I was, it was, it was not good. <laughs> it took me years to sort of pick myself back up again. And it's even hard to talk about it today, but you know, that process and the hard work um, was rewarded. They recognized me and promoted me to creative director, creative position there. And so, um, you know, it's, I'm glad in some ways that it happened because then I realized you know, what I need to change before it was too late. I mean, we could have got to the situation where, you know, I left the Fed, didn't retool, and then I just, you know, continue on in a different organization. So, um, you know, I think finding that other half of yourself, whatever that might be, if it's, you know, service design, design uh, methods, you know, and then creating a bigger toolbox. So strategic planning, um, solving difficult business problems, and understanding the big picture, which we'll talk about later. So some of these things are sort of talk about uh, later on in this discussion. Okay, uh, Michael, next slide. I guess that's your turn now. I'll kick it back to you. Okay, here we go. Um, this is uh, hopefully sort of a short little section where we just try to reorient ourselves, you know, try to assess where in the world are we? In a, and I think it's very helpful to be sort of conscious, in some way self-conscious of where you are at any given time. Um, I know I was raised in the high uh, elevation mountains in Western United States and orientation was always a huge thing for us because we would go on uh, climbing expeditions and extreme skiing, um, uh, sort of adventures, if you will. And just always being aware of your location became like super important just for your own safety. This happens to be a graphic that is, uh, I've got the link there on the bottom. When you get the PDF, you can click on it. But it's kind of developed to, to uh, for every major or even semi-major city in the world, this happens to track um, uh, average weather, I'm sorry, average temperatures over time, over many, many years. And the gradual sort of warming, heating up of the earth is kind of evidenced here. And also where that, those two tracks tend to diverge, that's kind of like the, the moment of truth where if you don't make adjustments at a certain time, things are going to go really bad, really fast, and you will not be able to recover from them. And I think that with a limited amount of, and so I'm using that metaphor with regard to careers, because um, in that we only have a certain amount of time and mental acuity, and we have to use that resource to the very best of our abilities um, to accomplish good things. And trying to assess, you know, how do you figure out how to create a career for yourself that will sustain over time, that when you reach the age of 60 or 65, maybe even 70, will you still have a way to generate income? Because you may live into your, hopefully, 70s, 80s, or 90s. And um, that's a thing to consider nowadays. So also, um, this is a great, um, series of short articles by Roger Martin. It's called uh, Fear Rules. And he, he offers, um, he suggests that fear of change often trumps the fear of burning, which is an interesting thing. It says nowhere is this truer than in business. I, I have found that to be so true. People in business are absolutely dreading 
the next quarter's number, or they're fearful of what may of whether or not they'll be able to uh, adjust to certain market changes and so forth. And and also, I think as designers, we can be um, enmeshed, who are enmeshed in business, we can also be um, fearful. fearful. Fear causes leaders and followers alike to imagine the worst case scenarios. And so uh, Martin offers sort of five different rules for handling fear, just being eternally village, uh, uh, vigilant. And, um, and then and so he goes on and has to do with storytelling and so forth. And it's, it's really quite a, a nice series of short articles. And I recommend them to you. So, um, and I think you kind of have to periodically take stock of, you know, what are your assets, your capabilities and, and enumerating the things that you're trained and competent at and those things that you're truly excellent at, where are you positioned in today's talent marketplace? And that um, it's, it's kind of important that we keep track of what are the most salient competencies out there right now? And what are the gaps in your CV where you do not quite uh, measure up or compete uh, for tomorrow's design jobs? And so this kind of, it may seem a little anal to get into to doing this in a regular basis, but I tell you, the, your career is the most valuable asset you have. It is what will sustain you. And so you have to treat it really well. And as I think the word is husband, in other words, take good care of it. And then also just find ways to do crazy things that you did not expect or find ways to do things that nobody's expecting to just shake yourself up from time to time. Um, I like to track uh, just kind of odd characters like the Duplass brothers who are producers and actors and so forth in Hollywood. And they sort of came into that uh, environment and they figured out ways to actually start creating small, short uh, films. And gradually they sort of built up a reputation working with young artists and so forth and actors and such. And they're able to build a real viable business that will sustain them and they will not be at the mercy of, you know, Hollywood uh, moguls or, you know, power brokers and stuff. So it's really important that, that we do this, uh, you know, taking stock periodically. So, you know, if you go back to the old 101 design methods, that book, um, I do reference this from time to time because actually this is good stuff. It just has a, it's a book that has a terrible title, it makes it seem silly and stupid, but actually it's just packed with all kinds of powerful and helpful design methods and heuristics. And the first thing you have to figure out at, at any given time when you're taking stock of yourself and your career is you have to figure out what are you really trying to do? What is your intent for the next 10 years or so? Where do you start again? And how can you start over and not fall back necessarily, but can actually progress and looking at the changes that are happening in business and culture and society, um, and then gather the latest information happenings, cutting edge developments, essentially just pour over this information just to stimulate your, your imagination, your creativity study those trends that are affecting your topic area or your discipline, because those trends will happen and you have to stay abreast. Looking at the effects of those changes and then reframing your initial problem. In other words, take your career as a, as a wicked design problem. And I think you can use some of those resources that you have that maybe you've mastered as a designer and figure out ways to sort of turn your career into something that isn't just some run of the mill standard track, you know, but actually is something quite unique to yourself. And uh, we, we also, you know, just because it's just by habit, I'm a interaction UX designer and we like to do user research and we like to build user models, personas or user archetypes. I work by the way in the, uh, I've worked for now 25, 30, oh gosh, 30 years in the healthcare industry. 
as well as in the financial service industry. And uh, so doing user research is like just part and parcel of what I do for a living. And it is so inspirational to try to understand who are these people you're trying to solve for. And especially, let's say, if you're looking at, if I were to create personas based on designers who are in the second act of a career, you're sort of maybe approaching or at middle age, you're maybe deep into a professional career. Maybe you're in middle management. Maybe you're a, a consultant of some sort. You have deep competencies, but maybe you feel behind the curve professionally. What are you missing? And do you feel unsatisfied? You know, it's just one project after another, one job after another, one gig after another. What we did when I moved to, I was invited here at the University of Kansas to help them develop a new graduate program. They had an informal one, but it was kind of weak. And so we put a lot of effort into building like a, you know, a pretty solid grad program. And one of, I, I remember from the very beginning, I knew the audience I was gonna go after. And these were mid-career professionals, early to mid-career professionals who feel like their career may have plateaued. And no, I'm not stigmatizing Angela. There's, there's been dozens and I think we've graduated over 80 people so far, but essentially you reach a point in your career where it just isn't so much fun anymore. And so these are just sort of examples of types of people that we've interviewed over time and we have a sense of who they are. And um, so I think it's helpful to do that. So we're gonna sort of shift into this new, this uh, Q&A uh, section of our presentation. And what I would like you guys to do, Angela will explain sort of, we're gonna use a, a little software application that will send you links to, to, to join in. But what I want you guys to do is think for a minute, take stock of what you have already accomplished over your career so far, all the knowledge, skills, capabilities, and in light of all the changes that are going on today in business and technology and society and culture, oh, and those changes are inevitably going to have impact on your career in the years ahead, if not already. So the question is, consider your vulnerabilities in your career. Where are you vulnerable or exposed? And, um, perhaps for over the next 10, 12, 14 years, I think it's really helpful to take a good hard look and identify those areas where you could really improve and build on, on your sort of stack of capabilities. Angela, do you wanna take it? Sure. Okay, so I sent you guys uh, a link in the chat and it's a fun retro board. Michael hates the name of the app. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It is very basic. I don't know. Has anybody used Fun Retro before? Yeah. Okay. Chris has. Okay. So, um, pretty basic. So all you do is so the first question. Um, so Michael, if you want to maybe show that question again. Okay, I will. You can. I'm just going to click on it myself here. Okay. Okay. So. Oops. Let me go back to the deck here. So the question, the question is, so take stock of what you've accomplished over your professional career so far. So example, your accumulated knowledge, skills, capabilities. Now in the light of all changes happening today in business, technology, society, culture, policy, and their inevitable, inevitable impacts on design the years ahead, take some time to consider your vulnerabilities over the next 14 years of your career. So this is completely anonymous. Um, what, what I like for you guys to do, so go ahead and click on that fun retro board link. And so we're just gonna take some time and I want you guys to kind of fill out these cards. So, you, so what you do just in the first column where it says, take some time to consider your vulnerabilities over the next act 14 years of your career, just hit the plus sign and then you can put in like maybe what your fears are. So the middle section is blank because I hate their margining there. So I wanted to completely separate these two questions. So we'll just take some time um, and I'll put 
put myself on mute here. Let me know if you guys have questions. So as you guys are going through this, um, for the column on the left side, uh, you can vote. So you don't even have to vote on your own. Uh, little sticky you put up there, you can vote on somebody else's. So go ahead, I think I gave you four votes for the left side. So go ahead and vote. If you feel like you've sort of exhausted your, um, all of your vulnerabilities, then you can go ahead and vote. I think we may have eight votes. <laughs> well, you have four. You have four in one side and four in the other. Ah. You could use all eight votes on the <laughs> left it, side, then. but then you no, can vote, vote on the right side. <laughs> <laughs> you you discovered my secret there. It's interesting that it's harder, it seems like, to come up with things to put on the right. And we'll get into that one. I think that's the next question. Michael's going to kind of go through that. So let's just concentrate for now on the left one. But I mean, if you think of things you want to put on the right, go for it. Okay, I feel like we've slowed down on the left side. So I'm going to adjust the way that this um, shows, sorts the, the cards. So I'm gonna sort them by votes. And if you refresh um, your screen, there you go. So six votes for the imposter syndrome. I actually combined those two together because it was a, a duplicate and there might be other duplicates in here, um, but you know, I think for me myself, I always feel that way. I always feel like I, I'm like I'm winging it or, you know, all these new things I learn. I, I'm learning them and literally doing them the next day. And so I feel like somebody's going to call me out someday and just go, <laughs> you're doing it wrong or something. I don't know. I mean, it seems to work OK. So I'm just going to keep doing it until somebody tells me that I'm doing it wrong, I guess. But I, I totally get the imposter syndrome. I think that is the nature of being a designer. I think that self-doubt is always there. 
Uh, the next one was uh, business competency. Uh, definitely, I think, um, you know, I know for me working at the Fed, just understanding all the different levels of business and all the things we do and our mission is so broad. And I've worked there for 22 years and still there's still some things, new things that I sort of haven't paid attention to because I'm over here doing something else. And so, you know, I think it's, it's hard when you're really focused and creative on one thing, just kind of switch your brain to that business competency. Difficulty sitting in an office, definitely. Um, I love this one, becoming a designosaurus. Too long at one company that design is not a core business. I actually voted on that one. Um, confidence, absolutely. Uh, lack of knowledge and how to prepare and then jump to a management role. So if anybody wants to talk about these, I don't want to out you <laughs> um, if you don't want to talk about it, but if there's something that you guys want to discuss, please uh, feel free to chime in here. And Michael, same for you. This is great. Uh, let's see, finding a new employer that will see the value you can bring to an organization. Lack of a base camp net network practically showing designs return on investment to business. I think that's, um, I mean, that's especially like where I work, where design is not um, the way we make money. And so just kind of proving our, plus everything we do is free and uh, we're non-for-profit. So it makes it extremely hard because our analytics are not always accurate. And um, it's hard to prove return on investment on things that we do. Uh, navigating ADA compliance, um, same for us. Current position lacks flexibility. I think all of these got one vote at the bottom here, at least. Um, let's see, I lost my place. Finding a place to be where you care enough to have a voice. I think if you, I mean, sometimes it's hard because you feel like people don't listen or they don't care and I mean, I get to the point where I'm, you know, I, I just keep sort of fighting the good fight. You know, I hope, I hope that eventually they take me seriously about some things. Um, learning and designing for VR and other fringe technology, choosing the wrong things to be good at, like HTML, CSS, mobile app, and the jobs moving away to other spaces. Um, you know, I, I think that's something where even with design, you know, artificial intelligence, eventually, you know, these things will become sort of democratized. And then, and then what do we do with our skills? Software skills or rather confidence. Need to pivot design career to a different discipline to expand interest, legal competency, building, busy building others' portfolio, not my own. Um, that's definitely something that I think, you know, maybe on the side, if you have time um, to pick up projects or um, I talk later on um, as we get into some of these other chapters about that. I don't have enough technical skills, can't keep up, lack of management experience, and then the list goes on. So um, we don't have to, to spend more time on it, but I think these are really good. I think it's really good for people to talk about this and see what other people are feeling because designers don't talk about this stuff. You know, we sort of bottle this up deep down um, and never discuss that we don't feel confident about ourselves because it's all about selling your ideas. And if, if, if you don't feel confident, then um, you sort of lose um, their confidence in you. And so um, I think this is great to have this discussion. Okay, so Michael, I'm going to pitch it back to you. Is it, does anybody want to talk more about this? Oh yeah, here we go. Sometimes business competency means being really good in a meeting, talking on the fly, which isn't always easy for a designer. I totally agree with that statement. Of just being able to sell your ideas and and um, you know, <laughs> I think that takes sort of years of training, actually. Um, you know, when you're pitching ideas to the president, feeling comfortable and not nervous about things or, but I think for me and, and what I do is I have all of that research I've done. And so there's no way to poke holes in, um, you know, 
the, the decisions that I've made or the, or the solutions that we've come up with. Anybody else want to chat? Uh, Lars here. Yeah. I just have a, a random question, um, just something to start some discussion. Um, you know, I find that when you're hired for a job, it's difficult to get the space and time to um, continue learning, you know, emerging software and to expand into other roles. Um, you know, if they hire you to do a certain ask a certain thing, um, <laughs> most likely you'll be doing that. So how would you navigate, um, you know, working with employees or um, encourage people to, you know, grow into new areas while they're restricted with their normal, you know, get, get the work you were hired to do done? You know, I think because I'm in an in-house organization, it might be a little bit different than, than where you guys are working, but um, I think that there are projects that aren't real projects. There are things sort of around the corner that, um, you know, as you're working on a project, there's, there's sort of information you pick up or gaps that you see that sort of end up in the parking lot over here that you don't end up working on because that's not what the project is. And I've had a few of those things come up um, throughout the years. And what I've tried to do is prove that those things are relevant and actually more important. And I do talk about that later on, but um, it, it is a hard balance. I think before I sort of made this switch, I kind of went with the flow and did what people asked me to do and sort of didn't pick up anything extra or even tried to look for those opportunities because I was like, this is what they want me to do and this is what I'm going to work on. And, you know, when I sort of got to the point where I was not proving my value anymore, what do I have to lose at this point? You know, I mean, so what I started doing is just like, <laughs> I'm just going to do some of these skunk work projects and not ask for permission. And I know that sounds terrible to say out loud, but sometimes I use my own time to do those things and it, it took more effort. And in some respect, you know, it took some doing ahead of time and then sort of asking for permission later. Um, but <laughs> If there's a way to sneak it in, I would try to do that. And I and I do talk a little bit later, and I have an example for you about that. I don't know if that answered your question. No, I, I yeah, think, it answered. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, I think my my only feedback on that, Lars, is uh, that's one of the dilemmas of having a full time job and so only so much energy and time hours in a day. You just have to find a way to carve out time to do it and otherwise you end up cutting yourself off from a lot of um, you know um, energy that could come into you and, and it enable you to evolve and to move into doing new things so it's not fair but it's just kind of like the perverse nature of having a full-time job I know in my case I got so burned out after the first uh, 12 years of my career that I just gave notice and I well, I, I did dedicate about six months to developing a business model and I started my own consultancy. And I, ever since then, I've had maybe what, two or three different businesses and it made all the difference in the world. In other words, I couldn't blame, I couldn't blame my boss if I wasn't happy because I was my own boss. And so I had to figure out ways to, uh, to like, get a life and really invest in learning a ton of stuff, which I did. So uh, we need to kind of push forward uh, because there's actually a lot of content yet ahead. So um, uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna push into the next section, okay? And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this kind of is, um, I, I've done some writing on this and, um, and others have as well this kind of phenomenon that has happened over the past 20 years where design really was, I'm old enough to know, does, design was a real backwater. It tended to be sort of, you know, um, 
stepchild status in business that, you know, in, in businesses, design was usually tucked under layers of corporate engineering or marketing and designers had very little visibility or influence. And, um, but over the last 15 or 20 years, things have really shifted. There's been a remarkable growth of attention to design as you probably already know to one degree or another. And there's new methods, new practices, um, new processes, new, all kinds of new tools uh, that can create sort of human centered value in all kinds of forms and designers are taking advantage of it. And these are the things that we need to like get super good at because frankly, most people with undergraduate design degrees never really got a lot of this kind of training uh, because who knows, your professors maybe didn't know much about it or the world was a different place in those days. So, uh, so let me see also, this is, uh, this is something a uh, um, design school just didn't really prepare you for the work that you do now, most likely. School just cannot prepare us for everything, of course. It's remarkable just how drastically and rapidly the design profession has changed. And um, Mike Kruzaniski, who's the VP of design for Twitter, he, uh, he's a former student of mine and friend and he writes really compellingly about it in this little book, it's called Design Exploding. I encourage you to click on that link if you get, when you get the PDF and read it. It's really powerful stuff. And um, in other words, the world we were educated in, the field we were trained for, those fields have evolved dramatically. And the complexity of problems we face now is really daunting. And so we need to get super up to speed on this stuff because the stuff that we think we should be focused on sometimes is really not the thing to be focusing on. And you kind of have to like take a second or third look at what was really most salient today. It says another trend that happened and it was a big one is as technology products competed for attention in the 2000s, design became a solution for companies to differentiate and attract customers and the design industry really exploded. It became popular, well-compensated profession, lots of jobs available, believe it or not, at one time. And this is truer than ever today. And um, the opportunity for the design industry, designers and design leaders has grown by orders of magnitude. And um, there's, all, there's a variety of different, um, even though a lot of jobs are moving in-house, shrinking the consulting industry, and I'm a consultant, designers are now working inside. Companies have really benefited incredibly by bringing design in-house and then um, doing some of the things that designers can do at a, a much more substantial level, not just doing the things that they did 15, 20 years ago, but using designers as sort of idea machines. And, um, I'd say that in a way what's happened is design has sort of like served as a Swiss army knife, a universal tool for business and it's proved to be a catalyst for growth. Powerful design tools, methods, something design leaders had espoused for years when I was coming up. Everybody was just relenting about the fact that nobody appreciated the poor designers. You know, it's like how things have really changed and nobody was listening back in those days and now they are. And so by using solid qualitative research methods to help businesses better understand their customers, I tell you, businesses generally didn't give a shit about their customers, you know, except for some lame marketing reports. Now they have an opportunity and they have tools to know those things. Using various modes of creative problem solving, research, crafting comprehensive customer experiences and creating really quality, uh, products and services, telling stories that convey that quality, creating new forms of value. That's what innovation really is all about. So this is what we're talking about here. We're, act two is, act two of your career is an opportunity to get good at creating broad system value for organizations, whether you are internal to a corporation or organization, nonprofit, whatever, 
Or if you're a consultant, there are opportunities. I find myself frequently being brought in by companies time and again, because I can give them something that they cannot do internally. And uh, as a result, they pay a lot more attention to it because they're paying a lot of money for it. And uh, so the consulting industry has not completely dried up. So designing your way forward requires proactively studying topics well outside the scope of design books. So the answers are not in design books necessarily. They're not even in design schools or conferences because they don't have the answers to the problems we need to tackle. So new opportunities will emerge for designers and design leaders that are paying attention and learning the necessary skills. And the kinds of things that served you well in your first career act are unlikely going to be enough in your second act. And the qualities that distinguish a designer who is adaptable of learning a whole new leadership role and skill set for top level management, those are things for years and decades we've been frozen out of top level management. And increasingly, there are designers in top level management. And I think, you know, there, those opportunities, there, it's not just a random luck that they happen to stumble into. So you can say to yourself, well, designing and managing are two separate jobs, two different jobs, but I don't think so. In some ways, design management can cross over and it can be well aligned with design, even though you may be a, <clears throat> sorry, even though you may be serving as a manager, essentially you can be serving as a meta designer in that capacity. So design is not just tucked under engineering or marketing. Design has become a strategic player in business worldwide and organizations are using design in lots of new ways. This is Jamie Mirvold. This is an article that she also published in the same booklet of, that uh, Kruzaniski did. So it's design uh, at Adobe is now a strategic function centered on customer journeys with the goal of delighting at each touch point. This means uh, focusing on design beyond the products themselves, focusing in uh, design decisions across technology groups. In other words, it's not just a design group or a design sort of, you know, like, um, you know, some sort of isolated area, but design is actually integrating across organizations. And there's some excellent examples out there that are well documented of companies that have done this. So, you know, the thing that made user-centered design so powerful is that corporations started to build it into the early stages of product development. And that created consumer user value uh, that brought the organization to understand that kind of like the, the golden egg that could, that could create new value and innovation for companies, which frankly, most people in business are, the, are just shitty at innovation. They just don't have the skills and understandings. So, so the, I would offer that design's uh, next generation practice is very different from the previous generation. And using and employing design in a strategic capacity at an organizational level, it requires the organization to change, but it also requires designers themselves to rethink and change and learn new stuff. Even, and they may have little or no formal innovation practice training or experience. You know, you cannot really expect, uh, let's say a, a design degree to like last or to be effective for very much longer, right? It's, it's like you kind of have to be a lifelong learner and you have to like dedicate yourself to learning new stuff that you're just not gonna ever get on the job because they have hired you to do one thing and their agenda is not necessarily your agenda. Um, so I think you can find ways to serve in all kinds of interesting ways. Well-trained and educated practice theory, you can use these things, models and methods. A whole realm of strategic design opens up. And um, so, you know, let me just go forward, it says, so this is kind of, I think maybe the lesson of Angela, and I was not fully aware of Angela's 
whole story. You know, I knew bits and pieces of it, but it was interesting to hear her tell her story today. And I appreciate that. But, you know, I think that getting out of your comfort zone is like a big deal. And frankly, I may be preaching to the choir here, but uh, you need to continue to learn and push the boundaries of your own comfort zone and learn to lead my team to do the same. These are just some quotes from, from, um, uh, from her. And it says, the day when you could just show up for work, you know, this, sorry, this is a Bill Clinton quote. I apologize for that already. Never mind. Okay. It says, the future of uh, work of the future. And once again, I apologize for citing Tom Friedman, but sometimes he just makes a mistake and he writes something quite amazing. It says, the future of companies is to be hiring people and constantly training those people to be prepared for jobs that have not been invented yet. And you cannot be a lifelong employee anymore unless you're a lifelong learner. If you're training people for a job that's already been invented, or if you're going to school and prep for a job that's already been invented, then you're probably going to have trouble in the years ahead. You have to like figure out what are the next jobs going to be to create new value. And folks like uh, Coughlin and uh, Prokopov from IDEO, they did some of this work on uh, management innovation years ago, having to do with bringing sort of design tools into organizations and changing those organizations. Um, so it's not that it's, it's not uh, impossible to do this. It's just, you have to dedicate the time and, and bandwidth to it. And also design management at a strategic level, in my opinion, really amounts to meta design. You're designing, but you're designing at a whole different level. Meta design amounts to creating the conditions out of which great design can emerge from a team or a group or organization and that can create great value. So I never, I really have no patience for people who bitch, I don't wanna be a manager. Well, don't be a fucking manager. Be like a meta designer who's just applying uh, design in ways that nobody really had ever learned in, in business school. So acquiring this level of, of uh, management is no simple endeavor. You really have to work at it. You really have to educate yourself to get really good at this stuff. And I think the big, the big thing that's really coming to fruition for many, many, many years, design and business were very separate, very far away from each other. But increasingly over the last 15 or 20 years, we have gradually closed some of the gap between design and business. And that as designers, there's no excuse for not being really good and competent at the language of business. Because if you do not know the language of business, you're gonna get screwed because design happens in a business context and you have to get conversant in it. Otherwise you'll always be at a disadvantage. Here's our second Q and A. Okay. Okay. So it looks like um, some have already um, filled it out here. So we'll take Great. less time since we only have 16 minutes left. Okay. Um, cool. But um, imagine the next stage of your career is a design problem. What are some innovation opportunities embedded in that problem? We'll just take a few minutes here so that everybody has an opportunity to fill this out. I was just going to say, Michael, I know that you really mean business when you start dropping the F-bomb. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. She, she knows that's what's when right. he's, That's when he's getting passionate about a subject. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. No, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> so this question involves, you know, understanding that you're that as designers we have to take the initiative in our own careers to guide our own careers and not wait for anybody to do it for us and knowing all the changes that are coming down the road that are already here what is the next stage of your career as a design problem if you look at it as a design problem it's a complex one inevitably you will find some innovation opportunities to innovate your career and they're somehow embedded in the problem. So those innovation opportunities, if you look closely enough and think hard enough, 
you'll say, hey, this is an opportunity. This is a gap that nobody's quite meeting. This is something that people are not paying a lot of attention to. And those are the little hidden uh, sort of jewels that you can find and you can polish them up and you can, you can sort of build a career on some of those things. They're there, you have to trust that they're there. And as a designer, you have to be really savvy at, at picking up on them. So I'll stop sharing my screen and we can sort of go to, uh, I haven't had a chance to participate in the uh, um, session yet, okay. So go ahead and vote guys, if you haven't already. I know that we're still adding some um, down here at the bottom. How do I get to the next one? Uh, it's on the same uh, fun retro board. Okay. Do you have the, if you still have the link, it's still in the um, in the chat okay. window there. Okay. It's just on the right side. Okay. In the pink color. So I think people are starting to kind of slow down here and I'm just going to read a few of these. Wow, you and guys have been knocking this stuff out. Yeah, this is great. So uh, come up with own personal vision and mission and be able to get behind it. Helping others navigate ambiguity or disruption. Um, I think that's a, a big one, definitely. Improve storytelling to better explain the value of design. Mm -hmm deeper understanding of user research methods and data analysis. It's great. Implement improved integration between design and development to empower focus on outcomes, not features. Learning to explain my unique value add. I think sometimes it's easier to show than explain. Um, it takes a lot of time, I think, to do that. Presenting work on communication continuous education, design leadership, double down on getting super competent at machine learning as a design tool, make research a pillar of my career, uh, career trend forecasting, that's hard to do, <laughs> learning how to use AI for design, COVID realities has awakened the possible to be, to better create the landscape, flexibility of how I wanna work, a blend of office and at home. If we are designers, we should be able to design how we best work. I totally agree with that. I love working from home. Um, I'm still working from home, have been since March, and it looks like this is gonna move into next year and totally dig in this. I mean, working downtown every day my whole career, um, hated the commute and I miss seeing everybody, but um, you know, it's kind of a nice switch and change seeing fear for what it is and moving on to the real problems, elevator speeches, global markets, technology and the business of design has evolved. Opportunities exist that did not even exist when I started my career. Neural network design, pivot to focus on design as a problem definition and solving versus a career delivering artifacts in a specific industry discipline and leading a design org in a virtual office. So I think cool. these are all really great. Um, let's go ahead and move forward um, with the next part of the presentation, Michael. Okay, very good. Oops, here we go. All right, Angela, you're up. Can you see that? Oops. Are you there, Angela? You're on mute, Angela. Oh, yeah, I'm talking this whole time. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll try to talk fast because uh, I know we only have 10 minutes left, but this is kind of the stuff I was alluding to earlier. So how do you condition for your mid-career hurdles? Because you will absolutely have them if you aren't already or haven't already experienced them yet. And so for all the reasons that Michael just talked about, um, but demonstrating your value and you have to prove that consistently consistently and keep up the reminders. So brand yourself, be on their face. And I think that the hard work, the time, the value gets you a seat at the table. Like you have to continue to prove yourself consistently over time um, and be unique. So find those skills that nobody on your team or organization can do. 
And I know that that's like deep soul searching, but I bet there's some things that you could embrace and learn that nobody else in your organization can do. And if you can do that, then I think that your value would be so tremendous. You could go anywhere. You wouldn't even have to stick around there. Um, so do those things that make you stand apart from your competition, maybe even take a business class or get a psychology degree, something totally different from design. And I, I guarantee you will make you think differently about your work and then keeping one eye on your career path. So uh, review job postings and see what skills patterns are emerging. I do that all the time. I get job postings from LinkedIn. I always look at what skills are looking for and match myself to those skills. And then I'm always prepared to retool. Now I wasn't before, and you know that's kind of where I ended up in the gutter there. So I think you have to prepare to retool at some point in your career. Um, the next one, Michael. Okay, so being a rock star. So this is kind of what we talked about earlier. Um, I think Lars was asking. So. You know, I think that you can use design thinking in any business problem. And I think sometimes what I started doing is taking what I was learning from school, the book that he talked about is a terrific book and just using it in my work. So I didn't really tell anybody. I just sort of did this. Um, and as my solutions improved, people started noticing and asking, what are you doing? Or, or can you help me with this? And so it sort of was a grassroots effort for me um, you know, I, I know that we use research and we need to use design thinking on some of the UX projects, but not necessarily in the rest of the design world at the Fed. And so it was sort of new and it helped sort of gain trust and consensus. And, you know, what's fun about it is that it's really hard work, but it's like magical to peers and executives when you, they see you do this. It's like you've like all of a sudden you're, you know, this sort of mastermind and uh, business problem solving. So if you can find those skunk work projects, I think that that will go a long way. Um, I have an example and I'll, I'll mention it really fast. So um, during all this, you know, when I was going to school and getting my master's, I, I was asked to redesign some exhibits in the Money Museum. And so I went down to the Money Museum and I started using some of my design methods. I observed, I did some interviews, um, both with guests coming in and also with law enforcement. And in those interviews, I found out that people were totally lost. They were totally lost. They didn't understand why they're at the Federal Reserve. They were trying to go to a museum. Why were we asking for their ID? People would walk out. Um, we realized that the branding was horrible. Um, the experience was not good. And you know, then we started looking at how can we improve the experience and it came down to wayfinding. Uh, people couldn't find their way. We, we needed to frame this experience for them. So when they walked in the door, they knew that, you know, somebody was going to take their ID and that that was okay. And that we weren't, you know, like big brothering them by taking their ID and putting it in our computer. And so um, there are a lot of things that we did with branding and signage and website and experience and interactive displays to soften this sort of you know, entrance into our world. And that project, um, you know, I had to get, there was no budget for it. I made it up. I had to go to my senior vice president and show her my findings. And, you know, once I showed it to her, she's like, you know what, Angela, I didn't realize how much this sucked until you just showed it to me. And so I think it's possible to take those pieces, those projects, finding those skunk work projects and really bubbling those to the top um, but, you know, she could have said no and been upset that I spent all my time um, working on this. But, you know, I felt really strongly with my research that this is the right approach. And so we spent a long time completely redoing the Money Museum um, based on that research. And, and after that, then we worked on the exhibit. So um, next, next one. Michael, oh, I didn't talk about coaching others, uh, but that's okay. I'll talk about it. Um, next, so strategy. So the, the long view focus, the thing that I see designers do, and it honestly drives me nuts, is not having, they have tunnel vision. Um, UX designers do it, graphic designers do it, visual designers, they think of only that thing, the thing they're working on. 
and they never think two steps ahead or about the whole ecosystem. You know, they design the chair instead of designing the chair inside the room, inside the house, inside the neighborhood. And, um, you know, the problem with that is that you get further in the project and you realize you just designed yourself into this box. And, you know, when I look at solutions now, I always think about this ecosystem and sort of the strategy behind it. The other thing is to do stuff that sucks. Um, you know, there are projects that come along that are not in your wheelhouse. There are projects that are looking for an owner, and I would do those projects. Um, not the ones I talked about earlier where I'm paying bills and anybody can do that. The ones where they don't even know who to give it to because there's not, you know, a SME in house. And so just pick up the project, work on it, and I guarantee it'll give you some insights about the business. Um, the other thing is to share honest, unpopular feedback uh, in, in a diplomatic way. You know, that's my job as a creative director. But, you know, if somebody, you know, I'm designing a website right now, and if somebody hates something I'm doing, I want them to tell me. And, and that trust goes both ways, right? If, if I allow them to tell me my work sucks, then when I tell them, you know, I, I think we need to work on this and let's talk about this design. It, it allows for us to build, you know, trust and also, you know, teamwork and all of those great things. Uh, next one. Okay, so my daughter is a designer. Uh, she is a actually a student at KU. She's a sophomore, and these are things that I tell her. Um, I think that this doesn't matter, you know, what level you are in your career. I think. These are the sort of the principles to stick by. Um, you know, she and I, as, as she's decided to be a designer, I tried to talk her out of it <laughs> and it's in her blood. I couldn't talk her out of it for all the things, the fears that we've talked about before of why maybe being a design uh, student is not a good idea right now, but here we are. So, um, you know, I am, I worry about her career. I worry about our jobs being artificially intelligence into software. I know that Adobe, they even talk, talk about democratizing design. Um, so where, where does this leave us? You know, I think for her, these are the things that I tell her, trust your instincts about your solution, stick to it, um, seek out the person that is better than you and then find out why they are. And then just keep reworking things. And if you're stuck on something, just step away. I mean, I think we can get in those creative blocks and our confidence starts to go down. And so what can we do um, to, to, to sort of overcome that hurdle? And I think you really have to do some quiet play, do a puzzle or something. So um, they do say that that, that quiet sort of um, mind numbing activities will help you sort of get over creative blocks, um, question and evaluate everything and keep your confidence high, no matter how difficult the problem. So tell yourself, I, I don't know how I'm going to do this, and, and I feel really sort of unsure about this, but the end result is going to be great. And I think if you tell yourself going into it, then it's easier to sort of get through that process. And then when you learn new skills, teach other people those skills. Okay, Michael, I think that's it for me. Okay, great. Um, I just want to wrap this up uh, right now. Uh, we're at the end time, and I, I don't have a lot to offer here, but... Actually, I wanted to tease, uh, we do have, this is a workshop, a three-part workshop or a workshop in three acts, right? We've just completed act two on the mid-stage career. And I'd like to, uh, at some point, maybe spring sometime, early spring, maybe Tom and Lars and UXPA will sort of uh, host this again for the act three. It's kind of like the big payoff, if you will. And I call it vesting the reach and power of design across society. And uh, Mike Krusenitsky and I were talking about this. He says, what are the next 10, 12, 15 years gonna be like? You know, and we're talking, everybody's sort of going nuts about you know, machine learning and AI and so forth. And that's inevitably going to play a role. But I think rather than being sort of like scared to death of it and so forth, we can find ways to appropriate it and if, if, if AI, if certain AIs can put some of our design out of business, then 
by all means, take it. Let's do some more advanced kinds of design that machines cannot easily replicate. So the next 10 years are going to be about, and this is what we've discussed, merging our skills with activism, specialized knowledge and critical issues like the environment, health, energy, education, information, security and policy. And also I wanna chip in the idea of authorship or entrepreneurship. That's a big deal to me. And in other words, I think design has been like wildly successful over the last 10, 15 years, but design has also sort of been captured by business. And we've sort of gotten lulled into working solely for the bottom line. And, you know, I don't want designers and I don't think we will, but there's the risk being in the pocket of business, having real good responsible positions of even leadership in some of those companies of being uh, essentially neutered and um, complicit in kind of how they're operating in the world. And uh, I think as designers, we, we can kind of chart our, our, our course ahead and we don't have to lose our souls in the process. So these are things that we'll probably be uh, noodling with in our next um, act three session. And I hope you guys will, you know, uh, maybe check it out. You shall be getting maybe something on it, you know, in the coming few months or so. And uh, we'll see how it goes. But I think it's, uh, you know, it, I, I'm kind of excited for, I'm now in my third act, right? It's like I'm 65, man. And I figure, you know, people are still working into their 70s. I'm not done yet. But I don't want to be doing the same kind of shit that I was doing, that I've been doing necessarily. Uh, I want to do different things. And I think there's some opportunities to do just that. So uh, I'm willing to hang around. Oh, one other thing before we go, just because I have to push this program that I lead. Uh, for those of you, or uh, if you know somebody maybe that you work with who might want to uh, uh, possibly apply to the uh, uh, design master's program at KU, either in interaction UX design or design management and strategy. Uh, you can click on that link on the PDF out there. And if you don't have that PDF yet, we can maybe uh, get your emails and send it to you. But essentially that's just links and so, so forth on information, courses that are offered and, and that kind of thing. So uh, and we're happy to send you information on that regard. So that's, we, that's all we've got, Tom. Do you have any, uh, thing, anything you'd like to add to before we leave? Yeah, um, thank you so much. My that pleasure, fantastic. our pleasure. I think, I think uh, everybody found it um, very beneficial. There's some, there's some little messages going in the chat, so. And I think, like you say, you know, a lot of the things you were talking about are things that designers don't talk about together. So I think it was really helpful to have, you know, a forum like this where we can actually get some of these things out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's just valuable learning from each other and valuable conversation and val valuable dialogue as things are changing so much and our careers are changing, uh, especially the, those of us in our act two <laughs> right. <laughs> you know so uh, yeah thank you so much for facilitating this and i wish it could be longer actually or we could do a uh, an act 2.1 maybe <laughs> that would be fun um but uh yeah thanks again thanks for taking the time and thanks for all your hard work just planning all that, those slides out and getting your ideas on paper and sharing your story angela yes um, Thank you for listening. Honest. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for um, participating too, you know, right. with it with the board. So that was great. Okay. Take yeah. care, everybody. So, yep. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Angela. Good work, ma'am. Yep. Thank you. That's uh, are those your illustrations, by the no. way? No. 
Okay. Oh gosh. Okay. That's getty. That's all getty. Okay. Well, they work. They don't know? even match. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. It was sort yeah. of a poor uh, example of my design work there. Yeah. <laughs> but well, hey, you know, know, when you're when it's crunch time, you just throw in a dinosaurus. Actually, hey, it, the dinosaurus it editing I did yeah. took me the longest out of all the, the different yeah. graphics. So okay. I was pretty Good. proud of that. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Take care. Thank thanks, you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Angela. Bye.